Karachi. We're at, here at IGE Talks. So we're going to be talking about something that's been going on on the news quite a bit lately. We're, we're going to be talking about the police brutalities in the Michael Brown case. And another one that you brought up, Paul. And, and also we're going to talk about the erectile, election, election, electile dysfunction. <laughs> election. <laughs> and how uh, electoral politics play into situations like Ferguson and so we're going to cover a wide gamut today, and we're going to try to do this all in about an hour. Yeah. So let's go around and uh, introduce each other. Let's start over here. I'm Michael Johnston, and I'm currently editor of the Work in Progress, which was the Grand Valley Labor News, which has been around since 1978. And I got my start with Cesar Chavez. That's all that needs to be said. Wow. Um, Dr. Rick Rosselli, I am. Uh, I teach quantum physics and biblical studies and the world religions, and uh, I teach and speak, um, and I life coach also. Mike Franz, IGE board, um, and in terms of tonight's discussion and the political ends, uh, I'm the local coordinator for MoveOn.org. My name is Kim McKeon, and I'm a volunteer here at IGE as well as a board member. Retired uh, businessman. I'm Judy Bookman, <laughs> and I volunteer here at a retired teacher and a peacemaker. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I, I'm Chester Lowe. I'm a board member as well as the producer of the show here. And I'm J.D. Sullivan. I'm the editor in chief at Cook County Star. And I'm Renee Karachi, and I'm the co-host at IGE, and I'm um, a board member as well. And I'm Paul Mayhew, and I'm uh, a facilitator in leadership with the Voices Not Heard in Michigan movement. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to my co-host and let her kick off that particular portion of what we're doing. Yeah. Um, so what are the different views and different feelings you've been hearing about the Michael Brown case lately? Any friends, families, negative, positive comments, remarks, different opinions? Anything you disagree with? <laughs> Trying to take it all in. I mean, there's to take in. Yeah. And uh, you want to see justice rendered uh, for the, uh, the whole community, because everybody's got to live in the community. So you want the facts brought out and uh, uh, good decisions made. That's my concern. That's why I'm watching it very closely mm -hmm. myself to make sure that uh, I keep up with what's going on. I don't want it to be swept under the uh, the rug, so to speak. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, definitely some facts are being twisted. Um, some say that he was provoking the cop or that um, he, did, he didn't have his hands up or he had his hands up and he, that was his way of provoking and he had a gun or he didn't. Like many different things are being said about it. Yeah, it seems that, of course, the court, we all know the court is flawed in a lot of ways, and the, the cop that committed the crime is, is being sided with, and it seems like he's being supported, and there are others that don't support his actions as well. I'd, I'd like to point out, and I've got some press articles here from last night's paper, or at least Tuesday, the night before. I always read it a day later. Uh, Tuesday, December 9th. Uh, but it, you, you may have become aware since the Michael Brown thing that 400, at least 400 uh, people a year have been gunned down by police in uh, the United States per year. Oh, that's right. And the majority of them are African American. Yeah. We talk oh, about absolutely. out of 400 people, we're probably talking about 375 <coughs> are African American. And so you know, I think, too, see, that, that, that brings back to us the whole political venue on this thing. You know, yeah. here we got, if we set the scenario of Ferguson, we have a, a, a community that is supposedly 70% African American. And so what baffles a lot of us is how can a community of 70% African American not be able to at least captivate 30 to 40% of the power, you know, in that situation, which brings in what we're talking about in in the whole electoral process, 
how does this how does this happen? I mean, it's where are where is Ferguson in relation to to the rest of the world? You know, in terms of people and their thought process about their rights. You know, everybody strives on a daily basis about dealing with their rights. So, but it took the tip of this particular iceberg uh, to 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 expose, you know, uh, what's happening, and and we have a taste of it here in Michigan. You know, I mean, here we got a situation in Michigan where the majority of the votes that were cast in Michigan were cast for Democrats, but then you know the Republicans win. So how does that happen? Can you explain that, Paul? I'm going to let Jim Sullivan oh, explain. Well. I can't say I'm an expert on it, but I got an email that basically it broke down the number of uh, votes that went to Democrats overall and the number of votes that went to Republicans, and there are more votes total for Democrats than for Republicans. The difference in who won comes down to the districts, uh, how the districts are drawn. Uh, so that there was a concentration of Democrats in some areas, and then it was kind of watered down in a lot more of, of the uh, districts, so that the State House and Senate gained seats for the Republicans that way, uh, which we call gerrymandering, when the lines are drawn in a specific way to uh, benefit one party or the other. Um, it's going to be an issue, I think, next year because there is a push to either by initiative, which could get circumvented, of course, <laughs> um, or I don't know how it's, it's going to get passed in Lansing, but there is an effort to uh, make the district line drawing process a lot less partisan. Um, how is that going to happen? It's impossible. It's very difficult because there are in 2010 yes. we had a census and the Republicans were in charge and they studied the demographics and they had their computer access to how people voted mm -hmm. and they redo district lines. Right. I was I live in Kentwood. I was in uh, Grand Rapids, Amash's district, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden I'm shifted over to Heisinger. Same here. You know, and I went, where, Heisinger? You know, he's out in Zealand somewhere. Right. And, you know, a totally Republican area, and they took all of our Kentwood votes and watered them down. Yeah. And Wyoming as well. This recent election, I was uh, championing a Democratic candidate from the 86th district, and uh, <clears throat> she was running again, Lisa, against Lisa Postumus Lyons, who was very popular. Yes, of course, her father was. Uh, Lieutenant Governor 20 years ago, and uh, and and there's a Republican district there that was drawn up. This is incredible because I, I was out there knocking on doors all summer and fall. Uh, <clears throat> they went into Ada and Cascade, which were heavily Republican <coughs> districts, and then they went east to Lowell and up to Belding, and they hooked around. They, they ended up with a horseshoe district like this <coughs> that they had the campaign in, and we had the campaign in, and half of the district was pretty much Democratic under normal circumstances, the other half was solidly Republican, and not a chance. Right, but it's like the first really. statement, how do we overcome something like, how do the people in Ferguson, which is 70% African American, so then we get into the race politics yeah. of this thing. Yeah. You know, how does 70% African Americans you well, know, they not tend to understand live in, in populated, that, yeah, uh, concentrated. Not understand areas. the whole politics yeah. of, of of gerrymandering, let alone understand the politics. Don't know what the word means. And you said another word, initiative. People need to know that oh. initiative means ballot issue. Right. right. We're gonna put it on the ballot. So yeah, if you can put it on the ballot, if you can get things on the ballot, you might get a great thrashing of it. Mm -hmm. You know, but. Does the people in Ferguson, Missouri know that their 70% means power and numbers on the police department? Just like the people in Michigan know that their power means that we shouldn't have been annexed to, uh, the, to, to the legislators in Holland because we have more in common with Grand Rapids than they do in Holland. You know, and as a result of this recent election, okay, 
and we've got a lot of people who are lame ducks, okay, so we're talking about a lame duck Congress in Washington and in Michigan. You know, and the issues they're bringing up are things like in Michigan, for example, uh, turning us into a state where the uh, <coughs> popular vote per, pretty much determines, you know, our distribution of uh, elect, you know, electors. Well, they take it away who proportional the majority. Voting. Okay, and that's what's going on in Michigan right now, and they're ready to push that through. In Washington, they're introducing bills that allow even more money than the $4 billion that was pumped into the recent election to be placed there, dark money we're talking about, which actually helped throw that election, you know, uh, the way it went, and we know how it went. It was a landslide for Republicans, and they've got the... You know, basically they've got 60, 70 percent of the money that goes into politics. Um, and, and they're they're trying to, in these laying back sessions, they're trying to increase their power. Yeah. The power of, you know, they're during the power of money and so forth. So 800,000 is the new proposed amount that you can contribute to uh, a single candidate. No, a party. To a party. Uh, to a party. Right. So right now it's 100000 and Congress is proposing to get it up to about 800000 per donor, per party. And in North Carolina, that was $100 million in that senatorial race alone. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, anybody, I mean, poor whites or people of color can afford a race like that? Oh, heck no. Heck no. And they might be 40% of the population, but they're certainly not representing the <clears throat> There's still hope. I ran, you know, I ran two years ago, and I ran this last two years and four years, and I can tell you, I, uh, the first time around, I ran with no help and no assistance. We ran on a shoestring, and we had the presidential shoestring, you know, mm -hmm. and Coke. I only lost by 29 votes. And I was able to raise three thousand dollars, and I spent twelve hundred of my own money. So that's very cheap, mm -hmm. and it's oh. very doable. Oh. Mm -hmm. That can be done. But in a non-presidential year, I got just snowed under thirteen hundred votes, and my side didn't show up. Mm -hmm. And it was mostly people of color didn't mm -hmm. show up. And why is that? Yeah. And let me talk about the messaging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, if we talk about messaging, <clears throat> we talk about Ferguson, Missouri, and we talk about Kent County and Michigan. Yes. Nowhere. In this state, was messages sent to the African American community to come out to vote. I happen to have created a piece of literature that said, you know, this is what's in store for African Americans. That created a firestorm because somebody downloaded it off my uh, webpage and passed it out. And the clerk called me and says, "Why are you passing out literature without a disclaimer?" I said, "I didn't pass it." But it created a firestorm because then people says, oh, we got this person in the race, this person in the race, and if this happens, then we empower the black caucus. But nobody was saying to us as a black community, no Republicans, no Democrats were saying what's in store. It was rugged individualism on both sides of the aisle in our, for us in our community. So the Ferguson people, 70%, Somebody's got them sleep. Got to wake them up. Got to wake them up. How well, do you about we know? Well, but we know that that money, that dark money, we know that negative advertising suppresses the vote. Okay. I mean, it does for whites and blacks. Mm -hmm. You know, the more negative it gets, I know because I went door to door. I mean, over four, six thousand people in four years, door to door, yeah. and, and I and it suppresses <clears> it. So they've got to have that. two issues going here, yeah. and as long as that's the case. Uh, in my work with MoveOn.org, um, I, uh, you know, I, I read in this article there were connections between investigations still going on after the hurricane in Louisiana and New Orleans about police brutality down there. The yeah. People yeah. Down. There's still ongoing investigations. I was on it when that happened. And I was on a national call one night, and, it's, and we worked in small working groups, and I had uh, a, a, a woman from Louisiana from one of the uh, we don't call them precincts, they call them the parishes. Parishes. Okay. Parishes. Yeah, parishes. And we were talking about one of the big injustices there. And I said, well, why don't you do this or do something about it? And she was just kind of like, are you kidding? We don't do anything about these 
these important issues. It was like she was totally powerless. She didn't have a thought, you know. And, and here we are in an activist group saying, you know, let's organize, let's do, let's do, you know, let's move on, you know, let's do it. You know, uh, one of the things, and, and uh, you can chime in. I don't want to. Oh no, I'm. Yeah, I'm, I'm liking. So I like listening to this. Go ahead, one sorry. of the things that I remember uh, when we dealt with police issues in the in the uh, 80s and 90s. Uh, was, and I thought of it tonight because I was listening to Radio 1 and Rev Reverend Wendell Anthony was on and they were talking about police and stuff. And, you know, they got this thing, the cold blue. Now, if there's, is never, if there's never any legislation or anything that does anything about cold blue, it would all be in the same situation because cold blue tells the police officers that you can't talk about if I if I'm a cop and you're a cop and we go out and, and something happened negative you talk about it cold blue tells you that you can't talk about it I'm that sorry. you can't that you can't say anything about what I did that was ugly and nasty that's what cold blue says so here we are we have a a a, 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 a situation that they might even deny that there's cold blue but there is cold blue. And cold blue says that if me and you are out there and, and something goes stupid, if you talk, you become a snitch within the police department. Now there's examples of that because I know one guy that saw a situation on uh, Division and Logan once, told about what happened. We took the issue to federal court and then you know he would get uh, dry, but pigeon blood put all in his car. Uh, uh, he would get left standing at, 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 at real risky places by himself so as to set him up to get killed. This what was this what would happen because you violated code blue. So if we so code blue makes black cops just as racist as the racist white cops. So, so, so actually when we talk about this police thing, we got to look at this cold blue thing and the effect that it has on people. Is that similar to the Serpico? Yeah, cold Serpico. Blue? Yeah, when Serpico, it's very similar to what happened with Serpico. Can you explain what happened with Why Serpico? don't you explain a little bit about Serpico? From what I remember, it was uh, a police officer in New York who uh, witnessed uh, some of the crimes that police were doing, and because he told on him, which is called snitching, Yeah, he uh, was uh, not just, uh, how you say, put under the bus and mm -hmm. put in the shade, but he was, they, they tried to kill him. Right. They left him in the position where he was being shot yeah. by criminals. Exactly what, what I'm talking about. Drugs. Yeah, I don't Illegal remember drugs. if it was drugs or, drugs. or well, but I, I, I think it was drugs, but I'm, I'm not sure. Serpico was drugs. It was, okay. it was a big huge uh, drug syndicate that had formed mm -hmm. inside the New York Police Department. Mm -hmm. But what happened down on Division and, uh, and, and Logan in 79 was swept under the carpet until 1983. Mm -hmm. And then in 83, the federal court took it because we got Steve Drew to actually carry the case. Mm -hmm. So in 1983, then that began to come into fruition, and that created the, I don't know, it was animus between Chief Haggerty and myself, but because I was one of the key witnesses to that incident. In fact, I, I was one of the key people that cops had their guns, and they had their hands on their guns, people were around them, and it was a young man laying down in the center of the street just getting kicked and beat and stuff like that because they thought he had drugs in his mouth. And when he didn't, because when they took him to St. Mary's to have his stomach pumped, there was no drugs. They gave him an enema and no drugs came out. So anyway. But still, back to Ferguson. You know, these types of things, the cold <clears throat> blue is what keeps us from having great police community relationships. What about the situation in Cleveland? Are you familiar with the situation that occurred in Cleveland where the 12 year old kid got shot by a police officer who was sitting in the car? He pulled up and remained in the car, shot the kid, and yeah. he was just 
on the playground coming off a of screen. And I think he had uh, earlier been uh, reported in to have had a gun or a toy gun or a BB gun. It was, a toy, like it was a toy pellet gun. It was a toy pellet gun. Yeah. And he was shot and killed for having that. I didn't, I didn't hear about that one, but it was another oh, incident. Didn't. It was another incident in Cleveland that where a person was shot uh, for not stopping or something like that, and he was just shot, randomly shot. And then they ended up giving him, him, a, him a traffic ticket. But he was shot. He was shot. Oh, wow. What about the guy in the toy store? It was with, you know, that, all these three things happened together. The guy in the toy store, mm -hmm. person of color, he was in the toy store, and he had the toy gun with the orange tip on it. Mm -hmm. Somebody called in, it was a Walmart or something like it, called in, guy, this is a dangerous black. Police came in and gunned him down. That happened within the Ferguson. And then, of course, the guy that was choked in New York. Mm -hmm. Those three, in a matter of a series of the same weeks, it shows you this pattern. I'll share a story. I'm not going to say the guy's name because he's still alive, but as I was campaigning, I got to know him in these four years. And he was a black person in the sheriff department, had the audacity to run against Selma. And I'm not going to say names mm -hmm. because he revealed stuff, and I write, I write, I keep a journal. And he said, you know, it's not just that, it's a good old boy network. And the way they run the sheriff's department in this area is a group used to be. It was a group of uh, inner circle that picked the candidate who's going to be. A, oh, that's true. Going to be the sheriff, and it's always been north of Plainfield. Nobody has ever been picked south of Plainfield Avenue. And he said he had the audacity to run. And this is a veteran uh, of the sheriff's department and exemplary career. Mm -hmm. But once he decided to run, he they assigned somebody to keep an eye on him. And he was sharing a story. He said, I don't know how I would have survived, but they, I got transferred to be the personal guardian of the judges. Mm -hmm. And one of them really, really liked me. So I was sitting in the office one day, and this is all, mm -hmm. you know, and he said, <clears throat> the guy that kept on, get your feet off. He had his feet on the judge's desk. Mm -hmm. And the guy that's been assigned to make life hell for him, mm -hmm. you know, he started getting written up, mm -hmm. steady. Uh, get your feet off the judge's table. And the judge got up, a white judge, and said, you know what, that's my desk. And if I want his feet off my desk, I will tell you so. So, you know, he said, put him down. But the point is, as soon as he had the audacity to run against the power that be, they made life miserable. But well, see, well, what you talk about is exemplary, and I'm glad you bring that up, because that's the hidden stuff that yeah, people don't is. see. They don't see that. See, north of Plainfield. But see, in our community, we know that the west side has controlled the police department. Can you explain anything? I mean, people are going to be looking at this show mm -hmm. who don't know, aren't acquainted with, <coughs> excuse me, aren't, aren't acquainted with the geography or the uh, demographics of Grand Rapids. Can you explain what North of Plainfield or West Side or even East? North of Plainfield is is. It's basically Northern King County. Northern but King what's the County. population like? Give me a, a description of the population. Rural, rural white, and Republican. White, rural, right, Republican area. Yeah. And, and the West, side. West Side, we talking about. Uh, 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 Polish, uh, mostly Polish, Lithuanian uh, uh, immigrants that migrated to the west side. Now you have a, a group of blacks over here, but in, uh -huh. in my young life, going to Central High, you know, we could not go behind Central High, which is the north side, after school. Really? Because yeah. it was right. that dangerous for yeah. black kids to go over there. Didn't you didn't go there. And we used to have to have that the gang school area and yeah. even the gangs used to have to come over to walk us home. They yeah. to home. <clears throat> so the so 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 all the politic out of the body of politic comes out of the gangs and all that stuff comes the politicians. And in your in your situation talking about the uh, sheriff department, the judges we had a system here in King County where before they retire, they announce that they're going to retire. And six months, they do it in an increment of six months. I announced my retirement. Six, within six months, we'll have a candidate. And we'll appoint that candidate to be that person. Well, that was, that was the way it was in mm -hmm. the judicial system as well as in the sheriff's department. Mm -hmm. And then the West Side controlled the police department. So when we as African Americans began to say we wanted some of that power through a group called the CRG and the Coalition for Representative Government, 
we began to move toward taking that power by electing representatives downtown that would speak our speech. Okay. And of course, none of this has happened in Ferguson, obviously. None of that has happened in Ferguson, Ferguson, Missouri. You're right. Yeah. Is anything like that happening in Cleveland? I don't know. Cleveland is such a huge place. But the, uh, what is the, the Stokes, the Stokes brothers. Yeah, the Carl Stokes and They were the primary Charles. black leadership in Cleveland back in the day. In the, in the 60s and 70s. But what has happened now is... All the things, and who was that I was talking, we were talking about continuity. So what happens in a lot of these cases is the young folks come up and don't get the, get the story about how to connect with what has happened previously. So they go out and try to reinvent the wheel, and the wheel is already taken off, but they, they, they say, I gotta reinvent this, cause my black radio hosts or my black people, my black preachers are not telling me about the connection between the past and now. Let me stop. Yeah, but that's why well, it's, it's a, a matter of education. You know, yes. You know, on, on a number of people, <clears throat> but you know, making sure that people yeah. are on this, the right page and the, and the same page. That we've want uh, we've mentioned a number of places, or I mentioned New Orleans. We talked about Ferguson, Missouri, Grand Rapids, Michigan. <clears throat> this article was in that Thursday edition of the Press on the uh, December 9th from Bloomberg News. And it's, it's kind of shocking in a way, but an, an indictment shows that justice can transcend race. So this is counter to you know the 400 shootings that go <clears throat> on. But in South Carolina, of all places, in a small town, called Udaville, South Carolina. They, on the same day uh, that the Michael uh, Brown, Brown, Brown uh, <clears throat> yeah, grand jury decision was handed down, they indicted the local police chief there right. for shooting a black man in a in kind of an incredible situation. And, and there were three other indictments in the same uh, part of South Carolina in the rural areas. Where you know they have basically seventy percent white, thirty percent black, but they have a different kind of race relation set up. But anyway, the, the police officers were shooting blacks, and and they got indicted. In this one uh, case that you may not have heard about, probably haven't. Uh, <clears throat> the, this uh, black man was a pillar of the, the community, and his daughter was arrested by the police chief or threatened to be in a routine traffic stop with. Uh, the damage to her headlight, and she called her father, and he came down. And they got in an argument with the chief of police, and later the chief of police issued a warrant for his arrest, uh, for resisting arrest or something. You know. mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> anyway, the father, not knowing this, went into the police department to pay the fine for his daughter, and the guy issued the warrant on him, and he turned and said, I'm not accepting this, and walked out the door and got in his truck, and he was pursued by the 38-year-old chief of police, who grabbed onto his car and then when he started in reverse pulled out his gun and shot him saying he was in fear for his life um, and he shot him three times or something you know. but you know what you totally un yeah. unnecessary uh, but what you exemplify is justice and it, you know in them convicting him but we have enough laws on the books to have justice but that's all um, theory well, that's, that's just them. Writing. That's just them and not just us. But it does apply to us. It's because it applies to everybody. It should. But it don't apply to us when it comes to actually meting out justice. That's what I'm saying. It's theory. Yeah. It's theoretical. Yeah. I mean, it's supposed to be, but in action, it's yeah. different than what's written and what's in action. Yeah. So how can we apply it? How, we, how can we get the... The, the, the words apply it to our communities yeah. as far as justice is concerned. Because the only thing I see justice as far as the law in the community or law in, in uh, the very communities is how Richard Pryor puts it, just us mm -hmm. here behind the box. Yeah. And well, that's what we need to stop. The but community. before we yeah. even stop yeah. that, I think we need to stop the murders that's been occurring around the country. Mm -hmm. And it does not happen overnight, nor does it happen uh, within groups like this. It needs to 
we need to go out into the community and find ways that people in the community can be aware soundly of what the police powers are and what the limits are. Right. But see, we talk about a How myriad we do of problems when we talk about stopping stuff. I mean, in my uh, a speech at uh, Rosa Parks, when you talk about death in the community, you talk about the economic death, you talk about sociological death, you talk about psychological death, and then finally, you talk about death death. So you can die three times before you die physically. And so what's been happening in, this, in these communities is that there is the first three deaths that have, look at what's happening in Detroit. Death has been rendered upon the city of Detroit through the whole regentrification project. They come out of bankruptcy, aren't they yeah. doing great? But oh yeah. <laughs> they don't even own the land anymore. <clears throat> So, so now, if I don't own the land, death, economic death comes upon me. And I die of starvation. I die psychologically. I die sociologically because I don't have any friends either. Because I don't have any money to go nowhere. So to, to uh, improve these situations, there's got to be a matter of education on all those different levels to bring justice to all them different levels. Well, you education need, is definitely the key. Education, you need a psychologist, you need a psychiatrist, you need a sociologist, <laughs> yeah. you need a doctor, you need a lawyer, yeah. all those people. You instead know, of just a priest. Instead yes. of just a priest. Yes. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, brother. And instead of a politician. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and the politicians are the ones who disguise themselves to be of great, how you say, Saviors. They and create really, xenophobia. Oh. And that's a big word, but it's a I'm it's, up, you're down. Right, right. right. You're yeah, like anything different than you. Well, right. Chester, Chester, you raised a good point, and I was waiting for somebody to do that. But, okay. but the rules of engagement, you know, the, the rules that the police officers who are empowered to use lethal force to enforce the law, uh, obviously there's something wrong with the way those rules are actually applied. Uh, I had a, a woman, a good friend, just taught, tell me the other day, back in the 70s, she was driving late at night on a rural road in, in Kent County, and uh, the sheriff's car pulled her over, and she got out of the car and started walking towards the car, and two sheriff, big sheriff guys, got out, pulled out their guns and told her, stop where you are. You know, she says, well, she just wanted to talk to him. Why did you pull me over? What's going on? And then they get, then they went into a long discussion. You know, what were you? Why are you weaving down the road like you were? She says, Well, this road is all potholed. It was a Michigan road, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And and I've driven these roads like this, you know, all the time. To like I did car. today too. Mm -hmm. He says, Well, where do you live? Well, you see that farmhouse down there with the light on? That's where I live. Mm -hmm. you know? and, uh, and here they were holding guns on. She said, What did I do? You know, and the most those police officers should have had to do in that situation is maybe if they thought for sure, maybe they were looking for somebody, I don't know, put their hand on the gun and raise their hand and say, halt, right mm -hmm. where you are. But to actually draw their guns on an unarmed woman, mm -hmm. and she was a very slight woman too, you know. Uh, and, and we were discussing the, you know, the Michael case. Um, <clears throat> Why did the police officer fear for his life? Why did he draw his gun? Was it somebody coming at him? Or somebody, you know, did he feel suddenly infringed upon where I better draw my gun because I think I better get ready for something? Or what, because we don't know. We don't really know what happened. It transpired as, you know, a young black man approached the car with his hands raised. We know that, I guess, of where they ran at it, I don't know. And there was supposedly an altercation that was life-threatening. Uh, it reminds me of the case down in Florida. With Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. you know, and Zimmer, we don't Zimmer. really know what happened as the gun was drawn. You know, was Did he see the gun being drawn in fear for his life and try to attack the person who was about to attack him? You know, these situations occur like this. And, you know, uh, 
It's, it's a paradox. My point is, we don't know. What is in the heart of the person who had the gun and pulled the trigger? And do you know, can you be certain, that the police <coughs> officer in this case, in Missouri, has no remorse? I was just... But you can't. I cared for my life. I did my Go job. Ahead. Don't you think we live in a culture that no longer knows what justice is because they think power is justice? Yeah, I think yeah. I think you got a point there because power so, is looked at as justice because you can take power. Let's even and look sweep at the current events that went out this week about the CIA. Oh yeah, Inter what? you know, in, in interrogations. Oh yeah, that's yeah. and they're calling oh, that good point. They're calling that justice. So from the top on down, yeah. we confuse. Power for justice. Mm -hmm. Okay, can, can anybody expound on uh, go ahead. That the CIA thing? Well, that goes back yeah. to when we were talking about the xenophobia issue that the um, that that politicians encourage is fear of anything that's different than you. Right. You're down here, I'm up here, just like what she was saying. Uh, they think seeking justice is bringing you yeah. down and bringing others, bringing others down, bringing them up as long as they're getting the power. Yeah, the CIA thing. Uh, just to follow up on that a little bit. It's a good, good point. Uh, <clears throat> released, they released a report that the CIA did torture, okay, during the Bush administration. And I'm, I'm sure we all know they continued it during the uh, But waterboarding and other practices were followed, and uh, they finally released the official word on that, you know. And um, some people are trying to excuse all of that. They said, well, it was necessary. You know, to, to get information, you know, to save our country, you know. Are these roses of Cheney? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cheney and Company, okay. Oh, yeah. okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and you know, I lost my train of thought there. So let me, just let, me, let me invoke here, you know, because I had this, this thought, you know, in terms of me being a large African American and my voice. Mm -hmm. And so I've had the problem throughout my life of people being afraid of me because of my size and my voice. Mm -hmm. I, in fact, you know. At, at, Especially at night know, when you're walking and there's You know, somebody. your size and your voice. <laughs> your voice, my voice will inflect when I'm excited and you say, whoa, why are you getting mad? I'm not mad, I'm just excited, you know? Mm -hmm. So my voice inflection and my size uh, dictates to how you look at me. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've ran through, ran into that, you know, quite a, quite a while. Especially, especially as an elected official, uh, or as a clinician working in mental health. Mm -hmm. You know, my voice infection, my size, and my color. You know, has played a role in how I uh, interact with people, because one one, you know, who is that talking on the phone to me like that? And then you see me this nice size African American, and then the fear of this young man who was that tall and that wide. So now it's fear, he's bigger than me. He's six seven and I'm six one. And his voice is probably deeper than deep. What do I hear, the Napoleon complex or something like that? Well, you probably have. Yeah, Oof. yeah. yeah. So does that justify people doing the, the things of being ready to shoot you because it, of your height? It don't justify race. it. Uh, it may explain it or define it, but not necessarily justify it. Because it's, you know, you need to, it, just because my voice sounds gruff, <clears throat> it doesn't mean that my heart is gruff. That's right. Jim. Wow. <laughs> I'm just getting overwhelmed here. Connections <laughs> between what you have said, you have said, you have said. Um, just, just now. Um, Facebook is probably one of the worst places to discuss anything mm -hmm. yep. with any sensibility. But you do get kind of a sense of what is going on in people's minds. And one of the things that I heard or read on Facebook in a discussion was that, well, and it was it was an unfair comparison, by the way. The, um, the guy who got shot, Brown, was, I'm not sure, but not that much taller than the officer. Mm -hmm. 
In Facebook, in fact, it's who can say their point the loudest and the most often and use illogical fallacies to trip somebody up. It's a matter of power, mm -hmm. of logic. Um, at any rate, that was connected to, well, there are 70% of the city is African American. They're in a majority. They should have more representation. That comment was taken in with the other one and said, well, no wonder the cop was afraid. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but that's just one small little example. We've, we've got a situation where with the CIA, the um, person being interviewed today said that, well, Bush authorized this, so that makes it okay. Uh -huh. Okay? That's one train of they, thought. Right. They are backpedaling a little bit on the necess necessity of it because the, um, the people interviewing them are saying, but was it effective? So now they're mixing words okay. and saying, well, we got good information from this program, which included torture, um, but, but the report that was just correlated. released said that no important information was retrieved through the torture. As that was very effect. damaging in right. itself, but some people said, well, yeah, but what if it had gotten good information? It's still <laughs> torture. Well, yeah, what if the spaghetti monster, you know, saved us all yeah, from hell as well. Torture. But <laughs> yeah. at the same, so you've got the authority, the person in power, as the one who makes the decision, and you've also got fear, because another part that was suggested was, we made mistakes, the CIA made mistakes, but this was at 9-11, and we had to do something because we were, you know, fearful or worried about terrorism, mm -hmm. and you have officers, I think, who might be under resource, and you've got the code blue, and you've got all of these dynamics going on, they're in a fearful situation as well. So you've got unwarranted authority granted to officials, and you've got fear mixed into mm, all of right. this. Mm. Yeah, that, that's a good point. It's a very, very good point, point very because good one point. of the things that I thought about, and I may be playing devil advocate here, and I, I, and I don't know if I can word this right, many of our policemen, I think, sometimes suffer from PTSD, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just like many of our military do. Right. Because I w watched over and over the video of New York, mm -hmm. of the man jumping. From behind. For, yeah, mm -hmm. from behind. And then his two buddies, or his two, his two co-workers, jumping on him. And that was all, I, I'm not saying that we don't have institutional racism, because I think we, I think we do. But I think that was all reactive. Mm -hmm. Well, collective know? behavior. Right, yeah. and he even come out and said, I, he said, he said, I was just using a technique that we used, and it was a wrestling technique. But it's illegal. <clears throat> yeah, it, that's what I. That's not what supposed I, to use that. But that's what he, what he, what he said. But he was also doing what he was trained, and what I'm saying is, some of that is Good instinct. Point. That's what I, and also well, some of that. Now let's talk coach about the told fear. Me back in the day. You know, here's some things you can do to hurt a guy, but of course we're not supposed to do that. The fear yeah. part. And he showed us how to do it. Yeah. It kind of implied, you know. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. The fear part, they're just <laughs> reacting then on fear, and that person at that time is experiencing something. Mm -hmm. It may not be true, but they are experiencing but something. But you bring an interesting yeah. real point up. And nobody has brought this up, is up but one person. It was one day I was driving to work and I was listening to NPR, and I wish I could remember her name, and she was a lawyer, and she was a civil rights lawyer, and she brought this up. She brought, she says she thought many of the police department. And their families. And their fa deal you with, know, right, PTSD. In Facebook, PTSD. There's, there's always going to be, well, you don't understand what it's like to be a family member of a police officer and work. I don't, but I also know that there's some things, some actions are not justified. 
I didn't say that it was justified, oh, but what right. I, but I'm saying but, I think it's more complicated right. than, than than just you know. yeah. Yeah, there's, there's all of these. Oh, there's a good story. Go ahead. She said it's more complicated, and see what, and I'll do respect everybody what they were saying in that, but in the bottom line, when you look at people and relationships and authority and, and, and positions, is the perception. One person yeah. might have, mm -hmm. and the other person sees the same thing taking place. It has a totally different perception. Mm -hmm. Somebody might see you, tall, dark, strong voice, and think you're a teddy bear. Mm -hmm. I don't see you. Don't scare me at all. Your voice, or your size, or a dark alley wouldn't scare me a bit. Mm -hmm. But the next guy might be scared to death. Mm -hmm. Perception is everything. You can take ten people, set them at a table, and give them a pencil and a piece of paper. And say we're going to have a, an incident take place over here. We want you all to write down what you see take place over here, and I'll guarantee you, at least half those people will have a different perception than what the other half did in regards mm -hmm. to what took place. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with things here that are impossible to sort out. They're impossible to sort out. I could take you back thousands of years. I could take you back to when they wrote the Bible, and the Bible was people's perception of what they see take place. Uh, their sayings, if you go back before the Bible was put together, the 66 books, you go back before that, and these were all sayings. Jesus said this, he said that. They were, they were writings, what he said. They combined them into, in, into uh, books, and, put, and piled them, and put them in, a, and called it the Holy Bible. You go any book in the world, what perception, you can read one book, you can read the same book, and I can read the same book, and we can all have a different perception. perception. Yeah. 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 See, we're dealing with the, the mechanics of a person's beingness of who they are. Yeah. And, we, and it's going to be both. We live in a dualistic world. It's going to be both negative and positive. The Kerner Report. You just spoke the Kerner Report when you talk about the dualistic world. It, it is. We can, live in a dualistic world. the Kerner the current Report? No, I haven't, but... Yeah. The, 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 the three-dimensional world we live in is a dualistic, negative, and positive. And when you understand the way the physics, everything's physics, everything's energy. You understand the way it operates, you can understand why people see things and do things the way they do. See, our whole psychological aspect of the way we, we uh, analyze people, uh, our counseling systems, everything, I'm not saying they're not helpful, they are. But they could be a whole lot better if well, it was more understood. Uh, from the educational standpoint, um, we're creatures that, that see, feel, think, and then act. You know, and, and we see something, and if the perception is dangerous, our, feel, our feelings override immediately anything that happens. Right. The feelings take over. Then we think about it, you know, and based on that interaction, which is really governed by the feelings, we act. And so, you know, if there's a dangerous black man approaching me, I'm in danger. Oh, he's reaching into the car. Oh, I'm really in danger. I'm reaching for my gun. You know, I'm going to protect myself uh, mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, uh, it's it's all. And yet the next the next person. It's a reaction formation based could be totally upon different than that. Yeah. the perception yes. and the feeling. Yes. And you know. <clears throat> well, the, guided by our emotions. Well, you, Something well, could, interfere that, that. Could, interfere you, that, could interfere with that. Training could interfere with that. Go ahead. Do you think, ahead, well, well, do you think what the two of you are describing comes from how people are raised and what people are raised on or what the parents or whoever raised the, ch the children, what they go by, mm -hmm. they go by what they're taught or what is on media, or do they go by... So yeah. it's, it's, it's it starts from when you're it starts from when you're a little bit. It's a collection of that. Right. It's a collection. It's a, it's a, it's a collection of that. That's so what I'm asking. The collection of the, the what I learn, you know, what I see, you know, what I hear, you know, uh, all that is collective. And then we come out as the end product of that collection. And then our groups that we function with home what we have collected throughout the years. So then we ascend into different groups. But is that, is that all noticeable? Can yeah. you see all that? You can see it. How? 
Because this is a group you see by right here. This group here come together because there's common thought. But there are certain things that are, that are occurring within the group that's not seen or not, not noticeable. Well, but I mean, we don't analyze that in this particular group. No, we don't. But, but remember, <laughs> but we do see hand gestures, thought. Uh, we see uh, assent. Mm -hmm. By nod, head nods, we see uh, we see eye contact and we see agreement mm -hmm. in this group. We see all that happens in this group in terms of group dynamics. But I think you know we need to be able to kind of bring ourselves down to a close because we're getting to about an hour. I just want to throw something over to Rick. <laughs> so uh, and then there's some people that, that haven't talked to and uh, oh Julia. Yeah. Because I know Judy has some powerful stuff there. But then you hold it back. Huh? Yeah. Well, I was, one thing I was just thinking of being a teacher where we used to have all white visitors in their books and stuff, and how we work to get the, uh, just something as simple as that, that you see people in your books. Yeah. And you start, you know, and then you say, oh, that's, you know, how do we do that? And we have over the years. Mm -hmm. I mean, now you look in the library, I got tons of books up with all kinds of people in them. So we're talking about media? Because no, she's talking about educational education. books. Educational yes. like information Like when I went to grade media. school, we read yes. Little Black Sambo. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I We did read too. Little Black Sambo uh -huh. and mm -hmm. ran around a circle until he turned yellow. No, that was Tigers. Well, yeah, the turn, 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 turn to butter. Yes. Turn, yes. The tiger so, turned to butter. Yeah, for the pancakes that they would be, they yeah. would be made for. So the I remember the little black sambo. I remember Jungle Jim, and we had to read all that stuff mm -hmm. to be indoctrinated, so that I have a negative attitude about black people when I come out of grade school. You remember the Lone Ranger? Yeah, and his sidekick Taco. Yeah. yeah, which in. Uh, African uh, language means slave. Oh, okay. Kim Osabi. Well, let's let's Kim let's Osabi, He was, you know, the Lone Ranger's slave. But do you know what that means? Do you know what Tonto means? Tonto. In Spanish? What? Stupid. Stupid. Uh, well, yeah. And let's do you know, you know, you know, Kim Osabi. But getting back to what you're saying about perception but, and, and no, this is I'm, like, I'm saying all this yeah. because it leads Sorry. back to what you're saying. Yeah, right. Yeah. To be here, which is the. The way we've been taught or have been taught are negative things for uh, through media uh, for people of minority or people of color. That's for Tonto is a person of color. And that, can, and I, that's, can, can I tell you about a fireside but cartoon? But it's, but it's, this is really you're good. talking yeah. about the way you were raised. Not only <laughs> colored people, anybody. Everybody. The way you were raised mm -hmm. is is the aspect of being able to to do things the way the collective consciousness want you to do it, the way society wants you to do it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean that's right. Right. Because yeah. mm -hmm. honesty right. is a cultural concept. Yeah. Yeah. Truism right. is a cultural concept. Yeah. So what's true in your neighborhood mm -hmm. might not be true in my that's neighborhood. That's very true. Yeah. And what's honest in your neighborhood might not be honest in your it's neighborhood. And that can truth. change from time to time. Yeah. Right. Yes. That changes because whoever becomes powerful in your neighborhood might say, well, let's change that. Mm -hmm. So let's let's kind of let's kind of tell, tell my little story. This is funny. We can, uh, but but you can tell it. Yeah, but we just got to know that we got to wind down. One of my down. favorites yeah. is shows the Lone Go Ranger ahead. in retirement, <laughs> and he's got a big pot belly mm -hmm. like some of us, you know, and his mask is hung up on, on the you know, chair rail. Anyway, uh, and he's looking in a dictionary. He looks up the word kimosabi, and uh, it says. Horse's ass, and he says, "What yep. the hey?" Yep. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> what the hey? <laughs> so the stupid calling him the horse's ass. Okay, <coughs> enough point. Yeah. Anybody what I was going to say, what I was going to say, he was. We we go into final, final statements. Remember Carl Sagan? Yeah. Final statements. Absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. I love that. Remember that. He. This is what I'm referring to when I say. The things that you're thinking, the things that are occurring within our own selves, we don't see it. But does that mean it's not occurring? That's right. It, it, see, and we're we're very ignorant in a lot of areas because we never pursued those. Ignorant or naive? 
I think it's important Both. to admit that. Iker is so. not knowing. Naive is thinking you know. But <laughs> 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 I see a lot of that. Okay, come on now. Let's, 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 let's begin the wrap down. But, it's, but, yeah, but so. you got four laws of the universe. One is you exist. <coughs> that means you are consciousness. You are aware of what's mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, and the second one is the all is the one. The one is the all. Creation right. is all one. Okay. All right. And the third one is that... Uh, that uh, whatever you think, you get back. Let's go to Johnson. And the fourth one, Hold the on. last one is, everything changes except the first three laws. Let's go to Johnson, and then <laughs> my co-host here, and she's gonna help, help us to wrap up. We need a segue or what? Yeah, we just took <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> I think in the long run, you know, some of us have lived long enough to see, what I, I was raised partly in the South, and, and then I was a teacher, so I saw the, the tail end of what was trying to be achieved in the South to my students. And one thing I can say, I retired four years ago, is that the crop of students now are genuinely colorblind. It's the most exciting thing to see. We still see the stuff at the top of killing the building, but students, young people tend to always be on the cutting edge. And I remember as a young person, I lived in the South for five years, and I came from Green Bay, Wisconsin, and we had no black people because it's too damn cold up there. Yeah. So I never really had any sense of black or white. Yeah. I moved down to South Carolina, and I was poor white trash. We were at the bottom, but of course in the South, you can be poor white trash and blacks are always below. Oh, yeah. And I remember as living, we were really, really poor. I mean, it was really dirt poor, but I remember the little white boys would run out to the bridge, this was third grade, and then the little poor black boys would run out from their stilt homes, you know, and they would call us crackers and we'd call them whatever. And I remember being with the other white boys and not having any idea why were we doing this, but that's the white boys were doing that, so the black boys were doing this, but no mm -hmm. sense of any anger in there. Mm -hmm. And then in fourth, and then I was sitting with my class and we were watching Remember the Titans, remember that? Mm -hmm. And then, what year is that? And I realized I went to that school, George C. Marshall, that played that team. Oh my and I'm thinking to myself, why in the hell did I not know that? Yes. I went into George C. Marshall ninth grade, completely <laughs> lily white, not knowing oh. that it was de facto segregated. Mm -hmm. Because blacks knew you didn't go there. There was no sign by that time, but that was like 1967, 68. And, uh, and another one where mm -hmm. I was in eighth grade, it was a new school. And, it's, and it was completely white, I didn't know, and all of a sudden, it was all over, people were going, oh, they got a black teacher, they got a black teacher, and everybody was going crazy, and I didn't understand, what was the big deal, Mrs. Minor, I remember mm -hmm. vividly. So the fact is, that's another form of racism, is that the idea, you're raised in your little world, mm -hmm. and I think, and I'm, I'm gonna be biased here, but I think a lot of Republicans grow up that way, I mm -hmm. say Republicans, probably Democrats too, but I, I mean, mm -hmm. they grow up in this, 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 this world where they don't know, they've never been poor, they've mm -hmm. never, and it's, they're not evil people, they're just like I was. I went to that school, I had no idea. I mm -hmm. wasn't particularly, then I went to an orphanage where it was almost all black. Mm -hmm. And I was picked on. And even then, a little white boy, you know, the nuns said, no, go fight for your, your own battles. And I went out there and I looked at these big black kids and they were street toughs. Mm -hmm. I never saw them as black, I saw them as street toughs and learned to run. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is racism, I think, is a learned thing. I think it's a learning thing. And so at the end of my career, the kids, we get into a lot of good discussions in high school, and the kids would always say, blacks get to affirm with blah, 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 their parents. They're just reflections of their parents. And I would always stop them, I said, okay, and if you, you that black people have it so, or African Americans have it so good, so you want to be an African American. How many would like to be an African American? Not one to raise their hand. You see, it's deep. It's deep. Yeah, it's deep, they know. Yeah. And I always love that because they're not racist, they're just picking up this crap. That's like people say the gays choose to be gay. Yes. Who yeah. would choose to be despised? But that's true. We, we got educated, we've changed. And I've seen from the era of Martin Luther King to now, and I could say it has moved forward yeah. and just this whole controversy over these killings. Yeah. I mean, four of them in a row. I do think it's going gonna, it's gonna to change, but I do believe it because I know a lot of policemen, PTSD is huge. Yeah, I think you hit a good point there. PTSD, yeah. I'd like, to say on. one, I'd like to say one closing statement on the end when it comes Please. to this. Come to IGE Talks where you can help build community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Because me... IGE Talks does build community because we live in a culture yes. that surrounds us with just capitalism. Even, even, even the words that we say, you know, people listen to us. 
And so we have an effect and we do have an audience. And I just want to thank the audience that's out there listening to us because, you know, it's powerful for us to be able to sit here and discuss these issues. Go ahead. Yeah, and like you said, just keep coming to the IGE Talks, um, build a community. This is very important that we talk about this as much as possible and in different ways because education changes as well as many issues that go on in the world. Thank you for listening to our show, and this is IGE Talks. I'm Renee, the co-host, and this is Paul Mayhew. Um, thank you very much. Have a good night.